ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start because you are in for a fabulous evening and an action-packed and knowledge-packed evening. Um, my name is Jenny McGregor and I'm CEO of AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne and I've actually had the enormous privilege over the last two days of uh, taking Martin to Sydney where he spoke yesterday at lunchtime. He then flew to Canberra where he spoke to our leaders program. He then came to Melbourne where he spoke at lunchtime and now he has the, we have the honour of this fabulous audience at the University of Melbourne. And um, I'm going to just do a pretty quick spruik for the book because I have um, had a fabulous time getting into this book. It came out first in 2009, Martin, yep. and for the last uh, 20 months or so, Martin has been knee-deep and in all of the data to update this copy, and it is an awesome resource. It's... Um, I won't tell you about it because he will, but I do urge you to get a copy and he will be signing um, at the end of the evening. It's an exceptional book. We have not seen the like of it in this country and um, I just wish that we could have taken Martin to every state. But you can get him on YouTube too. I think you need to update your YouTube probably too, Martin, don't you? <laughs> your YouTube is still out there happening. Your YouTube address, yeah. So, yes, your TED Talk, your TED Talk on YouTube. So, um, also a great resource for you. But my job tonight is actually to introduce our host for the evening, Oscar Sabakti. And uh, many of you will know Oscar. He's an award-winning multi-platform journalist with the ABC. He's a reporter and anchor for the Daily News for the ABC's International Service, Australian Network, broadcasting to over 40 countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Before joining the ABC, Oscar was a journalist for SBS, working across the network's TV and radio news and current affairs. And his stories have also featured on CNN. But um, this is my favourite piece about Oscar. He's met and interviewed the Pope, raising the issue of sex abuse with him. He's twice had a private audience with the Dalai Lama and he's met royalty from India, Britain and Spain. So you're in good hands tonight, Martin. He's, I don't think he'll ask you about sex abuse, but he does promise us to be controversial. So you're going to have a harder time tonight perhaps than you've had in the other audiences. So please welcome everybody, our host tonight, Oscar Sabakti. Thank you, Jenny, for that introduction. And I'm, my aim isn't to be needlessly hard. I, I just want to ask interesting questions. But of course, this event is about uh, the audience and uh, hopefully we'll have enough time to entertain your questions. Um, before I introduce Martin, I'd just like to mention our uh, Twitter uh, hashtag. Uh, we're encouraging all of you in the audience to firstly put your phones on silent, of course, but um, also feel free to tweet as the night goes along. The hashtag is China Rules. And um, also, just to give you a bit about the format of tonight, Martin's going to be giving us a, a presentation that he's prepared, after which uh, we'll open, open it up to questions. OK, I'm sure Martin needs no introduction, but uh, I've got one here anyway. Martin Jakes is the author of the global bestseller, When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New uh, Global Order. His TED Talk on how to understand China has had almost one million views. He is a senior visiting research fellow at IDEAS, a centre for diplomacy um, and grand strategy at the London School of Economics and a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He is also a fellow at the Transatlantic Academy, Washington, D.C., He's previously been a visiting professor at Renmin University, uh, the International Centre for Chinese Studies, uh, Aichi University in Nagoya, and Itsumeikan University in Kyoto. He was a senior visiting research fellow at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. He was formerly the editor of, of the renowned London-based monthly Marxism Today until its closure in 1991, and was co-founder of the think tank Demos. He's been a columnist for many newspapers, made many television programs, and is a former deputy editor of the Independent newspaper. He took his doctorate while at King's College in Cambridge. 
He's also the chair of the Harinda Veria Trust, which supports girls from deprived backgrounds with their education at Asunta Primary School in Pataling Jaya in Malaysia, where his wife, the late Harinda Veria, was educated. It has also sponsored young Malaysian lawyers from underprivileged backgrounds to work for two year stints at Hogan Lavelle's in London. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Martin Jakes. Well, thank you for those uh, words, Oscar, and also to Jenny. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening. Um, China presents us with two very interesting challenges. The first is that um, we've never before seen the like of a country of 1.3 billion people growing at around 10% a year, in other words, doubling in size every roughly seven years, and doing this over a period now of in excess of 30 years. Now, when China started this extraordinary process, the Chinese economy was very small. It was 120th the size of the American economy. Now, now it's over half the size of the American economy, and so the transformation of China has become, at one and the same time, the transformation of the world. Um, and uh, uh, this, this is very visible, uh, particularly in this region of the world, but globally it is now absolutely clear. China is constantly restructuring, reformatting, and transforming the world as we know it. The second problem that China confronts us with um, is, I think, more difficult. I mean, if that isn't difficult enough, this is even more difficult, which is how to understand China, how to make sense of it. Now, I'm afraid the lazy Western mind uh, uh, assumes that uh, it can just think in Western terms through a Western prism according to Western values and Western criteria and thereby make sense of China. And I want to argue tonight, uh, in the first part of my talk, that this is not the case. That we cannot possibly understand a society like China with such a different history and such a different culture by simply using Western-centric ways of thinking. Now, this is a big problem for us because for over 200 years, the West has dominated the world and in in the process, has come to believe that essentially the process of modernization is the process of westernization, that there is only one destination in terms of the process of, Western, uh, of modernization, and that is ultimately to be like us. And this is not the case. But we've only really started to think about this seriously over the last 50 years or so since the process of modernization took root outside the West and brackets in Japan and became very clear in East Asia, spread to South Asia, Latin America, and so on. Modernization is not just a product of technology and markets and competition. It is a function of history and culture. And if one wants to see a country which is extremely distinct from anything in the West, then China is the best example. China is not Western, it never has been Western, and it never will be Western. And if you want to know why we, get, and we don't understand China very well, or we don't understand China barely in many respects, and we constantly get China wrong, as I will try and illustrate to you in the course of my talk, it is because China is profoundly different. Now, the first part of my talk, I want to um, uh, illustrate, uh, I want to give you four building blocks for understanding uh, the difference that is uh, China. Now, the first is, um, is that for the last, um, for the last hundred years, China has been, has called itself a nation state. But anyone who knows anything about China, of course, knows that it's you know, one hell of a lot longer, older than 100 years. 
I mean, this was, these were the boundaries of uh, China in 221 BC uh, with the victory of the Qin dynasty at the end of the Warring State uh, period. And uh, the boundaries of China, the, the lower red line at the top, are today's boundaries of China. And if you just go forward to the next dynasty, which is still over 2,000 years ago, um, and this is the borders of the Han Dynasty. And what's remarkable already, 2,000 years ago, is that the Han Dynasty was already you know, not far short of the borders of eastern and central China today, where then, as now, the vast majority of the Chinese lived. The western regions, which are much, added much later, are, mu are very sparsely populated compared uh, with the eastern uh, borders. Now, what is fascinating about China is the sense of what it is to be Chinese, the sense of identity of being Chinese, and therefore what China is, does not come, of course it doesn't come, from the last hundred years. It comes from that long period of Chinese civilization. Or if you like, it comes from China as a civilization state. And I want to argue that China is primarily not a nation state, it is primarily a civilization state. So all the things that we most associate with being Chinese, or rather, more importantly, what the Chinese think of as being Chinese, uh, come from this, if you like, period of the civilization state. An ideographic language. A very unique relationship between state and society. A very distinctive concept of the family. Uh, Confucian values. Social relations like Guanxi. Uh, social customs like ancestral worship, um, Chinese food, Chinese medicine. These are all a functions of um, China's history as a civilization state. Now, this is so different from the West. I mean, in some Western countries like Australia and uh, uh, the United States, because of the way that uh, they were created, they are essentially, um, their sense of identity is purely and wholly a product of being a nation state. And broadly speaking, in, across the, Europe as well, uh, this is true, that, it, they are, uh, that their sense of identity, people's sense of identity, comes from being a nation state. So here we have a fascinating difference between the Chinese experience and the Western experience. The West, Western nations are countries constituted on the basis of nation, whereas China is a country constituted on the basis of civilization. There are two further points I want to make uh, in terms of China as a civilization state. The second is that very unusually in the case of China, uh, I mean, there have been many civilizations, Chinese civilization is but one of many, but normally they're not, they don't coincide, certainly over a long historical pe period, with uh, political boundaries. But of course, in China, the Chinese case, as, you, as I've illustrated, uh, they, they did. But for example, in the case of India, they most certainly did not. Um, and the third point is, the, uh, the first point is longevity, the second point is this coincidence, and the third point is that China, of course, is vast. I mean, um, it has uh, huge, huge geographical side, size and also uh, demographic side, size. So those four provinces there um, are, have a population between them larger than that of the United States. Or if we add these five provinces, all of those nine provinces altogether, each of them has a population larger than that of the UK or France. And extraordinary variations across China. I mean, we often think of it in rather homogeneous terms. We shouldn't. It's not homogeneous. It's, high, it's highly variable, highly, highly diverse. Um, Shanghai, the richest province, Gansu, for example, uh, one of the poorest uh, provinces. And so one of the uh, things that stems from this uh, diversity is that, um, that China is not... Is, it, it, China consists of many provinces with profound differences uh, between them. Now, you might say, okay, well, you know, this sounds like a plausible argument. You know, okay, China's primarily a civilization state. What does it mean in practice? 
Well, I want to give you two illustrations of what it means in practice. First of all, China's, uh, China's most important political value, I'm not talking about government here, I'm talking about the people, most important political value is unity. Um, and I think the best way to illustrate this is, is to think of what the most important differences between, maybe arguably the most important differences between Europe and China. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Europe was united in the Holy Roman Empire. And then for the next period of 2,000 years, of course, it broke up and it divided into many territories and ultimately is divided into many nation states today. The default mode of Europe is the division into many states. Meanwhile, China, over ex almost exactly the same historical period, went in exactly the opposite, historic, opposite direction. It went from being uh, uh, broken, uh, divided into many different units during the warring state period and then unified. And then for 2,000 years, its default mode has essentially been one of unity. But to maintain that unity across such a, 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 a huge geographical extent with so many people has been extraordinarily difficult. I mean, in a way, China is a kind of um, anachronism in the sense that it's still got this enormous uh, size uh, in both these uh, uh, particular uh, respects. And many of the worst periods in Chinese history have been associated uh, with uh, the country's uh, various degrees of disunity and, of course, great instability and so on. So for the Chinese to hold Chinese civilization, China, uh, China together, or Chinese civilization together, then the most, th this is absolutely the most important political value. Uh, and it leads to this sort of, you often hear with the Chinese, this emphasis not just on unity, but on order, stability, and so on. Because running a country, you might think running a country of 20 odd million people is difficult, but running a country of 1.3 billion people, a fifth of humanity, is an extraordinary uh, difficult uh, uh, operation. And if you want to know why Mao, for example, today is more popular amongst the Chinese than Deng Xiaoping, you can, there's lots of ways of sort of testing this in China, actually. Um, the reason, I think, is because it was Mao that put the country together again in 1949. For 100 years, it had been divided uh, during the colonial period uh, and so on, and where significant parts of the country, the treaty ports and so on, were occupied by foreign powers. Then uh, it was Mao that expelled the, 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 the colonial invaders and restored the unity of China, restored the sovereignty of China, and reconstructed the states as an important institution in Chinese life at the heart of China as a uh, political culture. The other point is more prosaic, I want to illustrate, uh, used to illustrate the, the, the notion of the civilization state. Um, and that is, um, you remember the, um, the handover of Hong Kong uh, in 1997, uh, from the British to the Chinese. And the Chinese offer was uh, one country, two systems. Now, in my country, I would wager that barely anyone believed the Chinese, really. They thought, well, you know, when the Chinese get their hands on Hong Kong, it'll just be the same as the rest of China. Well, 15, 16 or whatever it is, years later, uh, one can say categorically, um, we were wrong. Uh, politically and legally, China, uh, Hong Kong is as distinct from the rest of China as it was in 1997. Now, why were we wrong? Well, I think we were wrong because we in the West think of it, think of these questions in nation state terms. So if you add a territory to your territory, then you assume it's going to be the same system. One country, one system. That is the nation-state logic. That is the nation-state way of thinking. So when Germany, for example, is unified after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, what happens? Well, East Germany disappears, and the new unified Germany is constituted on the basis of the old Federal Republic of Germany, the old West Germany. And that's a perfectly natural way of thinking, because Germany is a nation-state. So one country, one system. But for the Chinese, it's not a nation state. It's primarily a civilization state. It is impossible to run a country at this scale 
this variation, this, this, the, these di this diversity on the basis of one country, one system. China's always in some degree been run because it is a civilization state on the basis of one country, several systems. So if Taiwan, for example, is uh, at some point cedes, uh, accepts the idea of Chinese sovereignty, which I think in the next 20 years is a fair, fair chance it will, then in return the Chinese will offer one country, two systems. But uh, probably an, an even more, um, um, uh, uh, in, a, in an even looser way than happened with Hong Kong. I think they will say, the Chinese will say to them, you can keep your electoral system as it is now. We don't, want to we don't think you should change that if you want to keep it. You can keep your multi-party system, your parties that you've got at the moment. You, you, in, up to a point, you can even keep your armed forces you know, su subject to certain provisos, as long as you accept the principle of Chinese sovereignty. Interesting point. So the Chinese actually have a different concept of sovereignty to the one that prevails in the West, or rather has prevailed ever since the predominance of the European nation-state system. For us in the West, sovereignty means uh, also the same system. For the Chinese, it doesn't mean the same system. So I think that one of the things that we can see with the rise of China is that the very nature of the discussion of political or national units will be very different. And I think that over a long period, I'm not talking in a short-term period, but over a longer-term period, the character of international relations will change profoundly. I mean, you know, this has been the era of European domination. And we are now moving into a new era where... Um, not just China, but 85% of the world's population that does not live in the West will have, in a way, their say for the first time. They will be the new subjects of history. They've never been the subjects of history in the modern period since the British Industrial Revolution. They've always been the objects that have been dominated by the West. Now, how will the world be different when they rise? Now, here I'm giving you the example of China, but let me mention India in this context. Because when I was in India in July, I was really struck when I was talking to Indian audiences about the notion of the civilization state, their immediate understanding of what this meant. Of course, the Indian experience is different because they didn't have the coincidence of civilization and state in the same way because actually it was really only in 1947 with Indian independence that for the first time this was true. But they certainly have a very, very... Uh, deep knowledge and tacit understanding of the nature of civilization. So these two huge countries, India and China, have in that sense definitely something in common. And in the future, this will, their historical experiences, you see, the problem is the historical experiences of countries like China and India have been delegitimated by Western domination. But what is going to happen is that they are now, in effect, going to be included. They're going to be enfranchised. And what they have to say will become part of the global debate in a way that previously was not the case. Okay, so that's what I want to say. If you, if you remember nothing from my talk, I think the civilization state is a good thing to remember. The second point I want to make is, is uh, the second building block, is about, is about China's... Uh, likely behavior as a global power. Now, we all wonder about this, don't we? We all think, what is it going to be like? Um, because, you know, on the, in view of the prospect that it will become the dominant country in the world, how is it going to operate? You know? and, uh, and I think it will operate uh, in a way which is very different from the Western uh, tradition. Uh, in particular, the United States and, previous, and prior to that, uh, Britain. And I think that the, the steer for this, I think, has to be history. Yeah. What, how historically have the Chinese behaved as a major power in their, in their own time uh, compared with, the, for example, uh, the Western uh, experience? Now, there is a very, very lazy Western way of thinking about, uh, for example, China, in the, well, about lots of things about China, but in the context of Africa. You know, how many times have you read uh, something which says, you know, China and Africa the new colonialism. Well, this is so lazy, because actually, unless you include, uh, which you can do, um, uh, the Chinese expansion under the Qing dynasty from the 
um, early mid 17th century onwards, where the, the, they expanded into the western regions, which I was describing earlier on. Now you could you can argue that was a form of colonialism. I think it'd be a, you, you can, but it was uh, internal. It was it was continental expansion. It was not overseas maritime expansion, expansion, which was the absolutely classical form of European expansion, uh, uh, especially after the great discoveries and the development of the great colonial empires of the 18th and 19th and uh, first half of the 20th century. Now, the Chinese never expanded like that. They never had any colonies. They could have had colonies. I mean, China was far more advanced than its neighbors for a very long period of history. So, for example, the colonization of Southeast Asia would have been for the Chinese during the Ming Dynasty with those great ships of Zheng He and so on, an absolute doddle. But they didn't do it. And the reason the Chinese didn't do it was they weren't interested in doing it. And the reason they weren't interested in doing it was because the Chinese felt that as the Middle Kingdom they were the center of the, uh, of the earth. They were the most advanced civilization. So why would they want to step outside of that civilization into something, into varying degrees of barbarism and so on? No. Whereas this was absolutely the opposite to the Western experience. The Western experience, what the, the Western tradition, of course, we're talking essentially about Europe for, a lot, uh, for many centuries. The European desire was to expand and project its power outside its country, around the world, and to the, what were the, I mean, the colonies, the people were obliged to speak you know, English or French or whatever it was. The language of, of instruction in schools was always English or French or whatever, what have you. The religion that was uh, uh, proselytized was Christianity and so on. Um, that was a very different way of exercising power. Actually, I think that Europe historically was a very aggressive and expansionist and bellicose force. And we saw this eventually in, you know, it, it came to an end with these two huge wars, the First World War and the Second World War, which were essentially the projection onto on a global scale of the many uh, rivalries and so on that existed in the context of Europe. Well, of course, that's over now because Europe shattered in 1945, has <laughs> turned over, has moved into a different sort, finally into a different sort of era. Now, it is certainly true that while... China did not colonize. It did have a system in that part of the world. And that system was called the tributary system. And it, um, uh, it, it uh, uh, embraced, uh, of course, China and uh, Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, all of those kind of countries, and uh, Japan and Korea and uh, bits of uh, the archipelago uh, states uh, like uh, part of Java and so on uh, in uh, Southeast um, Asia. It, was, it lasted literally for thousands of years. Um, uh, the tribute states remained independent but were required by the emperor, to, in, uh, the Chinese emperor, to present tribute uh, to uh, the emperor uh, from time to time as an expression of uh, the recognition of the superiority of China. Actually, the superiority of China is a very important idea because if the calling card of Europe was expansion and aggression, the calling card of China was a sort of cultural hierarchy, a notion that the Chinese were, and in some senses still think, I think, still regard themselves to be uh, superior. And that, I think, is, introduces a little idea about what might be the most important modes when China, or mode when China becomes uh, the dominant uh, power in the world. Well, actually, this lasted for thousands of years, but in 1900, uh, it, um, it finally uh, broke up because uh, China missed out on the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, which transformed the European countries, in particular uh, uh, Britain and France, um, and uh, the Japanese got in on the act as well, and uh, militarily, they were hugely, of course, modernized compared because of the Industrial Revolutions with where China was at. And that was the end of the tributary system. But we need to get to the present, and the present is absolutely fascinating. Because this chart here shows you 
the, the rise of China, the transformation of China, has spilt over, if you like, into the region in an extraordinary way. These bar, this bar chart here is the proportion of exports going from the various East Asian countries to the Chinese market. If you go back 10 years, most of these markets for Singapore, for Korea, for Taiwan, for Japan, the biggest market was the United States. No more. No more. The biggest market for virtually all these countries, I think now bar the Philippines, is China. Easily. Not slightly, easily. What's happening is the whole, the East Asia is being at great speed, profoundly restructured by the rise of China. We are, if you like, returning in one sense to the tributary era. The tributary era was based on, was a China-centric system. It was based on the, the fact that China was far more advanced than other countries in the world. Uh, the, the, the other countries in the region. And now uh, we are returning, in a sense, to that situation. So I don't want to go into great detail about this now because I'm going to return to, uh, briefly to this subject at the end. But East Asia is being restructured by the rise of China. We are witnessing the, a process of the creation of a new order in East Asia. Never forget how important East Asia is. East Asia is home to one-third of the world's population. It is already the largest economic region in the world. It is larger than North America, and it is larger than Europe. So it really matters what happens. Up until 1900, it was a tributary system. From 1900 to 1950, it was a colonial system. From 1950 to 2000, it was a sort of Westphalian system. It will not be that, in my view, in the first century uh, of the new uh, millennium. It will be something different. And it will be, above all, about uh, China. So, my, th my, my third characteristic uh, of, China, of China's difference uh, is something completely different. It's about race. 1.3 billion people. We all know that. China's huge. What I guess most of us probably are not aware of is that over 90% of the Chinese think of themselves as of one race, as Han. Now, this is so different from the other world's most populous nations, which are uh, India, the United States, Indonesia, and Brazil, all of which, in varying degrees, they regard themselves to be uh, multiracial and multicultural that it's extraordinary. Now, you could say, well, oh, it, obviously, um, China, a huge landmass like this, historically, was um, a home to many, many, many different races. And you would be absolutely right. Of course, that was the case. But that's not the interesting question. The interesting question is, why do the Chinese think, over, you know, over nine out of ten Chinese, more than nine out of ten Chinese think that they are of the same race. It's an extraordinary fact. Now, every country has its ethnic process of construction. Australia is a classic example. I mean, you know, European migration and essentially the destruction, largely large-scale destruction and, and marginalization of the indigenous people. Um, the United States shares that characteristic, plus, of course, the role of African slavery and so on. And China, Britain had its process, and so on. Every country has. Uh, and this is very important. It's greatly underestimated. It's important. International relations almost, almost completely neglects it. But this is very, very important. Now, the question is, well, why do the Chinese think like that? W what is the reason for it? How did this process happen? Well, let me go back to that hand map. Now, think of China as just the Han dynasty, if you like, that territory. And we can't understand why the Chinese think like this, how this process happened without once more returning to the, issue, the question of the civilization state. Because for 2,000 two, two years, China was created in this space, if you like. That's an, a very, very long period, and all within the same, basically the same kind of polity. And by a very complex process of uh, occupation, of absorption, of assimilation, of government resettlement, of uh, ethnic cleansing, and so on, slowly, slowly, but over 2,000 years, 
the, chi the, the sense of difference that distinguished one from another, different races in this part of China, became increasingly less important to what seemed, they seemed to have in common. And what they had in common was, above all, shaped by the importance of this idea of Chinese culture. And the sheer power of Chinese culture, I think, has got to be understood over an even longer historical period. I mean, remember that China was, with the Fertile Crescent, the first home to settled agriculture as opposed to nomadic uh, uh, peoples in the world to, uh, roughly 12,000 years ago. And um, therefore, it was also the site of uh, the first relatively complex communities, the first forms of centralized power, i.e. the creation of the state or government, if you like, in, in, in its earliest forms. And it's no accident, I think, given this kind of history, that you know, Confucius writing two and a half thousand years ago at the same time as the Greek philosophers uh, was producing such sophisticated ideas about governments, about the relationship between leaders and led, between, uh, about the moral imperatives of leadership, uh, and so on. And then fast-forwarding to the, type, the, the kind of period I've been talking about the last 2,000 years, um, some extraordinary uh, innovative and efflorescent uh, dynasties. The Tang, uh, then the Sung in the 11th, 12th century, probably the most inventive period of, uh, of China, uh, which, uh, during which were many of the inventions which were subsequently taken, exported in a sense to Europe and became very important in the Industrial Revolution. And then the Ming and even into the Qing. You know, China has been blessed with not one period in the sun, but from a civilizational point of view, several periods um, uh, in, in the sun. And so this has led, I think, to a very powerful sense of, uh, amongst the Chinese of a shared identity, a shared culture, and, a, 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 and a, a deep pride in that culture. And that is where ideas, essentially, I think, of Chinese superiority uh, come from. In other words, it's very, very deeply rooted in history. So the notion of the Han, if you like, is a sort of ethno-cultural identity. Now, what about its positive and negative aspects? Well, I'm clear that the most important positive uh, 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 aspect of, uh, of, of, the, of the Han identity is that it would be absolutely impossible to hold together a country as large as this in terms of population and geography without the cement of the hand. This would have been absolutely inconceivable. Um, people, if, if you remember after Tiananmen Square, they said in 1989, well, obviously China's going to break up just like the Soviet Union did. I mean, this was nonsense. This was arrant nonsense. I mean, the reason the Soviet Union so easily broke up was that less than half the population was Russian. But China, you know, over 90% thought of themselves as the same race. It was not going to break up. It was, it was inconceivable that that was going to happen. What is the weakness? The great weakness, I think, of, uh, of this process of Hanization has been that the Chinese view um, of other uh, cultures, other ethnicities, is that they too should be Hanized. You know, that, for example, the two most obvious examples in China today are the Tibetans and the Uyghur, um, and, uh, who regard themselves certainly as not to be Han and are not seen by the Han as Han, and certainly resist very strongly the idea that sh they should be Hanized. And th this has been a tremendous thorn, I think, ever since 1949. All the problems go back much earlier than that uh, in, f uh, for Chinese government because they've not succeeded in creating uh, a basis for a successful relationship between the Han and the Uyghur in Xinjiang and the Tibetans in, in Tibet and also in some of the neighboring uh, provinces. And I, it, you know, we, and I'm going to come to the subject of democracy in a moment, but we sort of in the West major on the problem of Chinese democracy. I don't think that is the big problem actually for the, in the rise of China. I think much more important is going to be this kind of question because to some extent, basically, the Chinese project their experience 
onto the rest of the world, just like the Americans do. I mean, you, you can't ex understand the American view of the world and how America's behaved as a great power without taking into account you know, uh, the destruction of the Amerindians, the uh, African slavery, uh, the sense of manifest destiny, uh, the notion of you know, the frontier spirit, uh, the universalism as, ex as expressed in the Constitution and so on. So what countries that become great powers project their historical experience onto the world and see the world in those terms. And I think the Chinese are likely to do that in relationship to their experience of, of ethnic, uh, of the process of ethnic um, construction. So, for example, you know, India and China are chalk and cheese as countries. They are so different. In every sense, they are so different. And I don't think, I, I don't think either understands each other very well at all. In fact, I don't think the Chinese really understand the Indians. Because the Indians are, it is so, so diverse compared with the Chinese uh, experience. My last point in the context of building blocks is, uh, concerns um, something that in the West we think are, is, we've got absolutely taped about the Chinese. We think that we know absolutely that the great weakness and vulnerability of China is the lack of legitimacy of the state. That is the Achilles heel of China. We see it retailed day in, day out in our media, in public discourse, and so on. The problem with China is a lack of democracy. The problem with China is the lack of human rights, and so on. Well, I want to disabuse you of this uh, way of thinking. Um, I don't think it's like this, and I want to ex try and explain why. We think that the fundamental maybe the exclusive source of the legitimacy of a state, the authority of a state, is democracy. I think that's where Western uh, opinion is these days. Um, and you've got to square that with the fact that I want to argue that um, the Chinese um, state enjoys more legitimacy um, in the eyes of the Chinese uh, than any Western state enjoys um, amongst its population, even though clearly uh, it's not um, democratic. This is, these are some figures compiled by Tony Sage at Harvard and the Kennedy School, um, are based on four sur surveys he conducted in his field research uh, uh, over a period of those, those years there. The left-hand blue line is the level of satisfaction with central government, and then it sort of goes down, you know, down to the, the township village, the purple line. And what is extraordinary about these figures is the sheer, you know, the sheer levels of satisfaction. I mean, it is inconceivable that any Western state anywhere could command figures of over 80% or now over 90% levels of satisfaction with uh, central government. <laughs> Uh, government. So, uh, if this is the case, then how do we explain it? Because it clearly, the reason for this level of legitimacy and acceptance is not democracy as we know it. Well, back to the civilization state. The Chinese don't see their state institutions in the same terms as we see us in the West. They think that the primary role of government or the state is as the embodiment, the protector, the guardian, the defender of Chinese civilization. The maintenance of the unity of Chinese civilization. In the eyes of the Chinese, nothing could be more important. I'll tell you now that if serious divisions opened up in China today, and the th there was a serious threat to the unity of the People's Republic, then this government would fall. Or, in, to put it in the old terms of Mencius, the mandate of heaven would be withdrawn. That is how critical this question is. So the whole way in which legitimacy and the whole way in which the state works in China is completely different from the way it works uh, in the West. The relationship between society and the state has been constructed in a very different way. So the attitude towards the state amongst the people is very different. In, in the West, 
uh, depending, of course, partly on where you are on the political spectrum, what do we think about the state? We, we think it's necessary, unless you're in the Tea Party or something like that, and it's well extreme on, on the right and the American right. We think that the state is necessary, but its powers need to be constrained. There are limits to what we regard uh, as acceptable uh, 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 involvement of the state. And we want those clearly regulated and codified in law and so on. Now, the Chinese have a completely different attitude. The Chinese attitude towards the state is not as a stranger or an alien or an enemy or anything like that. Uh, it is as not a friend, as an intimate. Not any old intimate, but actually as a member of the family. Not any old member of the family, but the head of the family. Member of the family with the state are the two most important institutions in Chinese society. Now, this is so different so different from the Western mentality to be, you know, chalk and cheese. We couldn't be like them, they couldn't be like us. That doesn't mean we can't learn things from each other. We will. We, we will have to. Uh, 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 that will become increasingly important. But they are so different for profound historical reasons. And I want to suggest to you, actually, that the Chinese state, far from being the source of weakness of China, is actually probably its greatest strength. It is a remarkable institution. It has presided over, in the last 30 years, over the most remarkable historical transformation in human history. That requires an extremely competent state. And I think what actually will happen as the West begins to take China seriously and think of China as it is, in its own terms rather than in Western terms, then we will be puzzled and perplexed and stimulated and curious, in a way we are not now, about the Chinese state. Because the Chinese state is set in a different paradigm to our Western history and our Western experience. The Chinese paradigm combines two things which we've not seen combined in this way. An extraordinary, competent, and ubiquitous state combined with, except a brief period, namely the Mao period, a ferocious commitment to a ferocious market. We've never seen this before. And we, I can assure you, are going to spend a lot of time over the next few decades and longer in trying to understand this phenomenon and, understand, and, and work out how it works. Now, at the moment, our interest in the West in terms of the state is only about democracy. We only ever talk about democracy. We never talk about the competence of the state. We have lost that ability to talk about state competence. Now, the Chinese, the Chinese don't talk about that side of it. They talk about the competence of the state. This is a very old Confucian tradition. It's not simply a, a communist tradition. This is a very old Confucian tradition. And what I'm arguing is the Chinese state is supremely competent. You compare the Indian state and the Chinese state, and we often, for understandable reasons, uh, celebrate uh, the Indian state, because it's a function of democracy. The problem is the Indian state doesn't work. It is deeply corrupt, much worse than China, and it just doesn't function in any meaningful way. Whereas the Chinese state is, is brilliant as, in terms of its competence, given that it's a developing country. Okay. Those are my four points. Now, I hope I've begun to at least shift your ways of thinking about China at least to say, okay, we, we, need to, we need to think about this problem in a different kind of way. We can't go on in this celebration of the Western ways of thinking in a world which is becoming, by the day, less and less Western and less and less familiar. We have to be curious about the unfamiliar. We have to make the intellectual effort that Westerners have refused to make for 200 years, which is to understand the other. That is the task we're faced with. Now, let me bring you right up to the present. 2008, the Western financial uh, crisis. And I want to argue that this was a major turning point uh, in the relationship between East and West, or in particular between um, uh, China and the United States. Oh, right. Well, uh, by the way, Australia's not on this. Not because Australia doesn't matter. Far be it for me to say that. 
but because Australia is no longer a Western economy. This, this is the picture of the Western economies uh, on the period since uh, the Asian, uh, the, since the Western financial crisis, and you'll see that with one, 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 one and a half exceptions, uh, they are all smaller than they were in 2008. Now let me add China. <laughs> and Australia would be well below China, but it certainly would be above that horizontal line. And do you know what the most obvious consequence of this is? Prior to, the Western, prior, to, prior to 2008, the projection for when the Chinese economy, economy would overtake the size of the American economy was 2027. And now the projection is uh, 2018, just five years down the road, five and a half, six years down the road. I mean, actually, China in lots of areas already started to overtake uh, 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 the United States, so steel consumption, mobile phones, etc. So look, you'll see there. In all these areas, it's overtaken. And then on the right-hand side is the areas it's still got to overtake, and the purple one is when it would overtake it in terms of GDP. Now, the consequence of this, I think, is that we've sort of moved into a new era. Uh, the new era is that, um, that the global economy and globalization is now being shaped by China, more than, certainly more than the United States. Uh, that is, I think, the kind of era. We, we, we've moved into the beginnings, the very, very beginnings of what I would describe as a Chinese economic world order. And you are absolutely, in Western terms, and I'll come back to this, on the front line uh, of this process. And it has four basic characteristics. One, the extraordinary trade imprint of China. I mean, China is a, a, an amazing trading power, which, given the fact in 1978 it barely traded with anyone, is a most extraordinary uh, phenomenon. And the most obvious expression of it for you is imports. You know, there you are at the top, iron ore. It doesn't say Australia, but it could do. Um, and, you know, China's percentage consumption, consumption of percent, uh, share of global consumption is, you know, you, is, of all these raw materials you can see, is quite extraordinary. But China is also... Uh, as you know, an extremely competitive uh, exporter. Uh, now, uh, this, this is divided into uh, geographical areas. Latin America is the green one. Then you've got North America, United States and Canada in blue, European countries in pink, uh, Pakistan and India in purple, uh, then uh, some African and Middle Eastern countries, and then the grey uh, East Asia. And right at the bottom there, you see, I didn't forget you. you see, I didn't, so... You can't argue that I'm discriminatory against your country. And, uh, and if, you, if I take the first line, which is only 1992, uh, with one or two exceptions like Japan, 5%, which is the highest, every country's share, their, their share of trade with China, share of trade, trade is exports plus imports, their share of trade with China is minuscule. I mean, it's 0.1%. 0 point something other percent, or 1 point something other, or maybe 2 percent. 2, 2 and then if you go nine years later to 2002, well, it's beginning to change, especially in East Asia. And then when you go to 2010, 18 years after 1992, you get the most extraordinary change. Look, do you know that in 1992, I don't think there was a single country in the world where, for which China was the biggest trading partner? Every country now that is coloured green, China is the biggest trading partner of. And it is not just in this region. It is not just in East Asia. It is all around the world. I shall read them out to you because it's a, it's a very important roll call. Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Venezuela, United States, Russia, Pakistan, India, South Africa, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Malaysia, now Indonesia as well, I think the Philippines isn't yet, and Australia. There you are, look. 20.6% of your trade was with China. Much more important than your trade with the United States. This is a most... And imagine what the figures are going to be like in another nine years. Look, Chinese exports aren't going to carry on growing at this speed. That, I don't think, personally. But in nine years' time... How many countries in the world will China be the 
the main trading partner with. That's one, so that's the first characteristic of the new Chinese economic order, if you like. Secondly, finance. China is becoming a real financial power. Um, in 2009 and 2010, two banks that most of you may never have heard of, the China Development Bank and the China Export-Import Bank, between them, lent more to the developing world than the World Bank, one of the two great institutions of the American post-war order. Or thirdly, the rise of the renminbi, the decision taken by the Chinese at the end of 2008 to begin to make their currency available outside its borders, not convertible yet, in order that countries, that they, can pay for trade, exports or imports in using the renminbi. The HSBC Bank has projected that between 2013 and 2015, half of China's trade with the developing world will be paid for in the renminbi. By the way, half of China's total trade, over half, is with the developing world. Now that trade is overwhelmingly conducted in the dollar. In future, it will be conducted in the renminbi. And the fourth example I want to give you is uh, of this new Chinese world, if you like, uh, is, is my old continent, uh, dear old Europe, once so confident that it was the, the center of everything and now is being um, historically marginalized. I mean, look at the problem of Europe. Do you see, uh, I must point this out to you, but if you look at the figures for uh, the percentage of trade with, between China, that China represents for European powers, I mean, it is absolutely stuck historically. It is being marooned by its failure to respond. I mean, did you know that Britain exports more to Ireland than China, India, Brazil, and Russia combined? Well, it's true. You would have to take it from me. <laughs> um, but anyway, Europe, Europe, back to Europe. I mean, um, uh, Europe uh, 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 has been uh, oh, very snooty about China, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, somewhat looking down upon China, to put it mildly. And then at the um, end of October, uh, during one of those serial summits to save the Euro, President Sarkozy, as he was then, got on the phone to Hu Jintao and said, can you give us a massive loan to bail out how, to bail out the euro? How the mighty have fallen. <laughs> of course, the Chinese widely, wisely declined the offer on the grounds that they'd probably never get their bloody money back. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, if you take Russia, Russia now is all eyes east. I mean, historically... The center of Russia has been the European part of Russia. But now, you know, as someone said, I've quoted this earlier today already, uh, and yesterday, I think, but some, some, some wise, uh, uh, wise person said, if Peter the Great was choosing where to cite the capital of Russia today, he wouldn't cite it in St. Petersburg, he would cite it in Vladivostok. And uh, I think that many a true word is, is spoken in that remark. So um, this brings me to my finale. Um, I, I want to first of all say something about East Asia and then I want to talk about Australia briefly. You'll be delighted to hear. Um, uh, East Asia, I said earlier that it was being profoundly restructured by China. You will all be aware that over the last year or so uh, under the Obama administration in the States, um, vigorous efforts have been made uh, by the Americans to try and reverse their decline uh, in East Asia um, with a strong emphasis on what I'm afraid America does do these days, which is essentially hard power. Um, tighten the relationships and alliances uh, with the traditional allies, Japan, uh, South Korea, the Philippines, and indeed your own country. Um, uh, seek to find a way back into something that it almost self-excluded itself from, which was the uh, arrangements in Southeast Asia around ASEAN and so on, and to launch a new trading initiative, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I think essentially is to uh, 
um, exclude China and, and, uh, and so on. Now, I just want to say one thing. This is a very complicated question, but I want to say one thing. This will fail. This will fail. I mean, it will succeed in some senses. It will certainly complicate the situation for the Chinese. It will make it more difficult for the Chinese. It's creating uh, new tensions, uh, new fissures, and so on. But it will fail. And the reason it was fail is because the basis of Chinese power in this growing Chinese power in this region is about its economic prowess and strength. You know, powers rise ultimately because of their economic strength that creates the basis for their political and ideological and cultural and military influence. And they fall or they decline because of the progressive diminishing, diminish, uh, uh, decline in their economic strength. And unless the Americans can address the problem that in this region they are a profoundly declining economic force, they will not be able to reverse the tide of history. Everything else is like King Canute. And I think that this is the American problem. Now, this brings me finally to your own great country. Now, extraordinary what's happened to Australia. I mean, here you have a country which historically has been located. Um, where is it located? I mean, it's located <laughs> off, off the Asian mainland in the southern hemisphere, bloody miles from the west, <laughs> but has always regarded itself to be western because of, in the first instance, huge or large-scale European migration. And that has been, in a way, in crude, simplistic terms, the story of Australia. And then you get the great transformation of East Asia and, of course, the great, above all, transformation of China. And China wants raw materials because China, like Japan, etc., is very poor in raw materials. And so it becomes the source of an extraordinary demand for Australian iron ore and thermal coal and what have you. Yeah? And this is, by an extraordinary accident, of geography and geology, Australia has been drawn into this deep engagement with China, which has transformed you. You are no longer a Western economy. You aren't. You have entered the Chinese sphere of economic influence. You have. Whether you, you, whether you, whether you want to or not, it's happened. Do you know you are the only Western economy that since 2008 has not had a recession? Do you know why? Because of China. The Sydney Stock Exchange now moves to the pulse of the Shanghai Stock Exchange rather than the New York Stock Exchange. In Australia has, is, has been drawn into a new kind of relationship with, uh, with China. But you haven't thought it out yet, have you? What's it going to mean? Where is it going to go? You're a Western country, but are you a Western country? You're a Western country, but you're not a Western economy anymore. Now, this is going to have the most profound ramifications. Now, I will say to you, you are fantastically privileged. You are incredibly privileged because you are the pioneer Western country as we move into a completely new historical era in which the West is no longer dominant, Asia is dominant, and above all, China is dominant. And you are at the cutting edge of that process. And you, it falls on you to work out, to think through what historically that is going to mean for Australia, for your sense of identity, for who you are, for how to engage in something that, let's face it, in your neck of the woods, you have completely hitherto ignored, which is Asia. 
you've never bothered to understand it, you probably didn't go to it, you'd fly to London sooner than you'd fly to any of those kind of places. And now, historically, you are cast in a completely different situation. Now, I want to suggest to you that there are two requirements that come from this. The first is you have to engage in a much deeper way with these questions. I mean, what is the historical question you're, fa you're, you're posed with, really, as a country? I mean, we, if, if Britain was down here, we'd have the same problem. It's not because you're Australia. It's because you are in this historical context, in this situation. And you are confronted with the question of, what does it mean to have, to have been a Western country, but now be obliged to engage in a completely new way with a, a most extraordinary country, with a remarkable civilization and a remarkable history. Well, for a kickoff, you've got to learn Chinese. But in a way, that is the easy part of it, because this is, a, this is going to be a hugely engaging exercise. Come and show me what you learn at University of Melbourne. Come and show me what you're taught in schools. And you can start root and branch rethinking what the relationship is now required in Australia culturally to orientate itself in a new way to this part of the world. I don't mean abandon what you've been. I don't mean abandon all the old forms of knowledge, but they are grossly inadequate, and they leave you insular and cut off from what you have to be exposed to and curious about for the future. And the second thing I want to say is this. You cannot historically continue in this new situation to ride on the coattails unquestioningly of the United States. It is not, not an option for you. You cannot think you can take the, the Chinese dollar, known as the renminbi, and just carry on being Western, and everything the United States does, you can follow, and you don't really have to question this anymore. And so you don't need to question it, because you never really question it, because that is the way Australia has seen its role since, uh, since before the end of the Second World War. Well, I don't think that works anymore for you, because you can't, you know, if, if there is going to be rising tensions and so on in the region uh, between China and the United States, which I think there are, and I think the main problem here is going to be the United States, not China, then you can't, you, you have to be in relationship to your new continent that you have discovered and you're going to have a fresh relationship with, and above all, to the country that is most important in it, China. You have got to have, you've got to be seen by them as independent-minded. I don't mean become an ally of China. I don't mean anything like that at all. But just that you have to think independently. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I'm sure all of you extracted something from that, and I, I certainly did and I hope a lot of you have some burning questions. But to kick things off, I'd like to ask a question of my own, or several questions, I don't know where to start. But um, you give a very glowing review of China. Um, it's almost as if you, you look at the country through rose-coloured glasses, and almost to the, to the point where we may forget a, a few of the flaws. And I should say from the outset that I don't have an opinion on what, what you've said or what China is about or what America is about. But... Um, Okay, you've described China as being the head of the family in people's eyes, but certainly if, if no, you're the not... State, a, the state. The state, sorry, is, is regarded as the head of the family. If the head of the family is someone that you, you're not allowed to question, you're not allowed to um, ever ask questions of that, that figure. Um, you also say that China isn't a Western country, but isn't it now one of the more dominant countries because of its wealth and largely because of the Western idea of entering the WTO and, and freeing up its market so that it can become uh, the wealthy country that it is. Um, some of the flaws that I can just think of off the top of my head, um, the, the migration of the Han Chinese in um, the Tibetan provinces, in Xinjiang with the Uyghur, um, some might see that as being a bit of a flaw. You, you also say that perhaps it doesn't have colonial ambitions, but then we look at what's happening in the East China Sea now with the Senkaku or the Diaoyu Islands, where they've very much sabre-rattled, sending six patrol ships as soon as uh, Japan bought those, those islands. 
um, also with the dispute in the South China Sea with the Philippines and Vietnam, is that perhaps a sign that they, they do have ambitions to, to spread their, their power and their culture? So I'm wondering... Oh, that's better. <laughs> So I'm wondering, is there a reason why you're, in your presentations you are overlooking those or not drawing attention to those, those flaws or those areas that, that need improvement? Uh, well, uh, it, it's certainly true um, that the uh, overwhelming brunt of my emphasis is a desire to try and convey uh, that we need to understand China in a different kind of way. And that actually what you've said is more or less what the sort of conventional wisdom is that you get in the Western media about China. Now, that doesn't mean that none of it's right, actually, uh, because I think, uh, you know, there are plenty of reasons for concern about China. You know, that, I mean, you know, China's a developing country. Um, there are, you know, there are many, many um, uh, unacceptable practices in China. Um, uh, there is... Um, as we've seen, you know, much, uh, uh, with, the, with the Chen, the, 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 the blind dissident, I mean, you know, the way he got treated uh, in his, um, in his, uh, by his local township uh, and the security authorities and so on. And I don't think that's an exception. I think this is, there are countless examples of this in China. Uh, but it's very uneven. Not everywhere is like that, you know. But it's, you know, but it's a huge country. So I, 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 I don't want to... Um, I didn't talk about them, but I certainly wouldn't uh, brush them under the carpet. They are, they are part of what China is, as you say. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, to take one example you chose at the end, which is, you know, I, I want to take exception to what you said about the Diaoyu Islands, or as the uh, Japanese refer to them, the Senkaku Islands. I mean, you know, the China... The, the Chinese, they were part of China. They were taken by the Japanese um, uh, uh, in 1895. Um, they, were supposed, they were then supposed to be returned to Taiwan after the uh, Second World War, but the Japanese kept them. If you look at a map, you can see they're very close to China and a long way from Japan. Um, but the reason the Chinese feel very strongly about it is uh, I don't think, I think it's not really a question of the islands. I think the reason why the, Jap uh, the Chinese feel very strongly about these islands is because of the totally unsorted legacy of the Second World, of, of, of the war. Or in, for the Japanese and Chinese, what started with the occupation of Manchuria by the Japanese in 1930. And... Um, well, I hope we're not so unaware of it, but you can never take anything for granted about China amongst Westerners. The awful brutality of the Japanese during their occupation of China. I mean, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in Nanjing, you know, hundreds of thousands. Uh, the Chinese say over 300,000 people. I don't know how many it is exactly, but we don't need to accept the exact figures. But a huge number of Chinese were murdered in this process. And, uh, you know, it, it was nothing like what happened to the, you know, the Westerners, uh, to, to the Western powers uh, in the war against Japan. I mean, this was, that, that was mild beer compared with what was done uh, to the Chinese or to the Koreans and so on. Now, the Chinese feel extremely bitter about this and the, um, and the fact that the Japanese have never really apologized for it. I mean, the Japanese have never really come to terms with it. I mean, they've had a form of words but that is not an apology. I mean, I can say sorry to you, and you'll know I'm being insincere. But I can say it in a different way, like the Germans said to Europe, and it was accepted, and it's completely changed the relationship between Germany and Europe. So, you know, the Chinese feel towards the Japanese like they feel to no one else. They don't feel like that towards the Americans. So, so we've, got to, we've got to bring, when you make a point like that, you've got, we've got to bring an under, some knowledge and understanding to these kind of questions and know when to distinguish one thing from another. Okay, let's open up to the audience now. Who's got a question? Do we have um, roving mics around the place or no? Can we ask that gentleman?
refer to the possibility of it getting out of control between China and Japan, and that's seemed to raise the ante in, in the discussion. I don't think anybody's ever thought that there'd be any military problems. Do you, do you foresee that any of the South Sea China, South China Sea problems could actually escalate into military confrontation? Uh, well, I, 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 I think you're r rightly distinguishing between the dispute between China and Japan over the islands in the East China Sea and the dispute in the South China Sea. Now, I think that the, the, the dispute between China and Japan is dangerous. I don't mean it's going to end in war, but because of all the elements that I've been trying to explain that are involved in it, then, and because it's between the second and third most powerful, economically powerful countries in the world, then there are, you know, th this obviously hugely raise, raises the ante. In the South China Sea, I mean, of course, there have already been conflicts. I mean, these, go, these run back to the 1980s. I mean, there was a clash between the Chinese and the Vietnamese, and uh, I think about, I don't know, I can't remember the figures, but 40 or 50 or maybe more Vietnamese died in that clash. Um, and, uh, and this has happened from time to time uh, since. There have been various, with the Philippines and so on. Um, do I think it's going to get out of control in, and, and become a serious, uh, uh, some kind of military conflict? I very, very much doubt it. I very, very much doubt it. I mean, I think the Chinese have handled the South China Sea. The East China Sea is a different issue. The South China Sea, I don't think they've handled it very well anyway, to be honest with you. I don't think they're very clear what they want. Um, you know, there's, there's various different agencies in China that, are responsible for the South China Sea, and they actually speak with different voices. Um, so I think it's quite complicated, and that this is an example where Chinese foreign policy, I think, has been uh, very inadequate. Um, but I, I don't, I, I'm sure that, uh, well, I, I would be amazed if the Chinese government did not want to very much keep the thing, you know, with the whole th th the situation from getting out of control. I mean, the, only, the, the, the one new imponderable is the arrival of the United States in the situation. Because it's clear, I think it's becoming clear, that actually America's using the Philippines as a kind of um, stalking horse in this dispute. Um, the Philippines, I don't think, would ever have done what they did. Of course, they're a military, very weak country. Uh, if it hadn't have been for tacit American encouragement, or at least the belief the Americans want them to do something. Whether exactly how it's happened, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, that, that once big powers get involved, uh, it can change the situation. But that's my feeling, that the South China Sea situation will, you know, will uh, continue to simmer, but not boil over. Okay, can we take a question from the woman with the, the red jumper that's had her hand up there on that side of the room? Martin, how do you think China will cope with uh, its changing population structure and uh, how, will you, how will this affect future growth and China's ruling power? So that last bit, the last sentence, I didn't catch it. Uh, how will that affect China's future growth and its role as a ruling power? Um, when you say changing population, what have you got in mind particularly? Uh, aging population. Yeah. yeah how... It's got this huge, you know, baby room, and they're going to get old, and they are getting old. Yeah, okay. So, aging, aging population is the key question. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, uh, um, it is going to be a problem for the Chinese. Um, the, the, they've reached the sort of cusp now, where um, uh, from now on, roughly now, um, the population will steadily age. Um, that's going to be a problem because um, the proportion of uh, the economically active as a proportion of the total population will decline and um, they will become you know uh, the, the, those who are economically inactive will become so the labor the size of labor force will fall and the size of those who are not economically active and dependent on those who are active which are a, a, a diminishing proportion of the population uh, will grow so um, 
so this is a problem for the Chinese. I mean, it's, a it's not absolutely as simple as we suggest. I mean, um, one of the big problems the Chinese have had um, and have been able to resolve the problem much better than, the Ind uh, than India has, for example, is, you know, the, the process of industrialization is fundamentally the shift of people from the countryside to the cities. And one of the problems the Chinese have had is this, you know, very, very large numbers of people leaving the countryside every year, work in the cities, can they provide enough work? Now, this has been a big problem, and, and it's also, uh, often it's talked about in terms of, you know, if they can't deal with that, the, the social instability to potential political instability and so on. Now, in some countries of the world, they never resolve that. If you take Egypt, for example, Egypt's chronic problem is, and, and, and the countries of North Africa has been, that they just, the enormous numbers of people have left the countryside and so on, work in the cities, young people, and they've got no jobs. Um, the Chinese have been relatively successful, but there's been a real pressure. So, to some extent, that pressure will ease, and I think that will, that will uh, make the, some of the social problems a bit easier. The other thing that I would add is um, they have one thing they could change, don't they? They could abandon the one-child policy. And I think they will. Okay, um, question. Well, sorry, Martin, too. To cut you off. No, it's okay. We're just trying to get through <laughs> yeah. as many as we can. But um, can we get the mic up the front here, please? Um... This lady here. Thank you. Martin, we've got a real problem in Australia trying to convince young Australians to learn Chinese. We have fewer than 3% of Year 12 students across the country currently studying Chinese, and the majority of those are Australians of Chinese heritage. There's a prevailing view that the world speaks English, and we're lucky, because we do too. <laughs> and I'd like you to make a comment on that. Uh, I'm familiar with the psychology, because it's the same in my country. Um, although it's not as urgent as your need to, to tackle the problem. Um, well, right across the Western world, there's been the decline in the learn of foreign languages. It's not just Chinese. And I'm sure the reason is because uh, they think they don't need, young people think they don't need to, to learn it. Because they, you know, well, it, everyone speaks English, don't they? Kind of uh, attitude. Um, now, there are two problems with this. Um, the first thing is, you know, to be honest with you, you can't really operate on anything like vaguely equal terms with the Chinese if you don't speak their language. I mean, the fact that a lot of, Chi the, the fact that Chinese speak, a lot of Chinese now, I mean, speak really good English. I mean, the, the decision of the Chinese to make English a compulsory subject throughout the school system has resulted in the cities in, you know, extremely high levels of competence in English amongst young people. So what happens is you're dealing with the Chinese who are becoming the dominant element in your part of the world and they speak English rather well, and they speak, you might have noticed, Chinese extremely well. <laughs> and they're the old Australians, you know, and you can only speak English. And you've got a few people who speak some Chinese. And you'd, you'll have to press into service, in particular, Chinese Australians, I suspect, in that situation. Now, you know, you're never going to be on equal terms with the Chinese if you can't speak their lingo, because there's so many things you don't understand that are going on. Because the language is not just a key to understanding words, it's to understanding a culture. Language is about culture. So I think that um, it's essential. And there's one other point I'll add, and that is, don't assume that English, as the lingua franca, is set in stone forever this would be a dangerous assumption. It would be a generalization of the present to the indefinite future. Um, two points in this context. I mean, if China is really going to be so dominant in East Asia, I think over the next, I don't know how long, because languages work over different periodizations, but I would think that Mandarin is going to become a lingua franca in this region, alongside English. Um, and, may, and probably displace English in time. And secondly, um, 
Historically, uh, the success of a language has depended on a powerful national sponsor, if you like. You know, I mean, the arrival of English, of course, the spread of English was because of the British Empire. But the big spread of English has been really post-Second World War, and that's because of, been because of the United States. Now, what about a situation where the United... Well, Britain is, <laughs> historically speaking, sorry, uh, and the United States is in decline. It's not going to be anything like the power it has been. I, I don't think it's going to be anything like the power it has been. So English is made... What is the major sponsor of English? So I think the thing that will maintain English in that situation is inertia. You know, like, lots of people have learnt it, loads of English teachers around the world, personal investment of time, and so on. But I don't think we should assume that English is there forever. And, you know, if Australians are going to have anything like a true relationship, an inter a relationship of intimacy and curiosity... And with China, as I think they have, they will need to, then they've got to learn Chinese. I'm sorry, it's essential. It is essential. It should be a compulsory language in schools here from the beginning until the end. And I was, I was in China recently and I was surprised at the number of Western people, people from Australia, people from Europe who are actively learning Chinese yeah. in Beijing. It's... I feel like I need to do the same. But yeah. we've got time for one more question. Um, so, sorry that we don't have enough time, but uh, when you do buy a copy of Martin's book, perhaps you can <laughs> slip him a couple of questions. The gentleman <laughs> in the blue shirt um, in the middle there with his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. So can we... OK. One, you can have two, one. <laughs> two questions. OK. Single pointed answers. Is that OK, Martin? OK. Martin, uh, ni hao ma, comrade. Because <laughs> um, you were a member of the, the British Communist Party, weren't you? A long time ago, right. when I was a student. Yeah. <laughs> My brief question, why weren't you involved when uh, Poulsen went with his uh, rice bowl to China begging after the KFC-WFC problem? If I can put a narrative of that for one quick moment... In 1984, 30 years ago, the highest Chinese ever to come to Australia gave an after-dinner speech in Canberra. He raised five questions. The key question uh, that I'm raising here was his last one. China will never develop like any other developing country whilst the Western world controls the world financial markets. There was a question there that basically said what was going to happen when Poulsen went to the begging bowl. And that was really been a long-term commitment and goal of China to basically get involved in WTO, the, all the financial areas. I say, why did you advise your treasurer then not to ask that question? Thank you. Well, I think that it relates to something you said, actually, um, which is uh, there's no question at all in my mind that, um, that the great transformation of China... I mean, it, it grew quite sensibly under Mao. You know, it was growing at about 5% a year, 5.5% a year. So it wasn't a bad growth record. But really what lifted it was uh, after Deng Xiaoping. And Deng Xiaoping was... Uh, Mark, uh, Mao was an arch... Uh, ideologue, really, and Deng was an arch pragmatist. And Deng Xiaoping recognized uh, that China was too far behind and had to open the windows and look at the world and engage with the world. This was the great transformation. And so I think your point you raised earlier, which is that, you know, China could not have got to where it was now without opening itself up to the West, is absolutely true. That doesn't mean the Chinese. China has westernized and is becoming like the West, but it did have to become, a, if you like, a hybrid. Right. And, uh, and I think this, this is very important, but it's a hybrid. It's, not, it's, it's, it's got Western elements to it. And I think that is what, uh, essentially, uh, China has succeeded in doing. And I would just add to that, we are now required to become, as Western countries, hybrids ourselves. We will have to learn from the East. We will have to learn from Asia. Okay, and the final question from that gentleman there. Uh, 
So, Jack, uh, throughout the course of the presentation, um, you've made um, no mention of the um, Chinese diaspora. Um, this economic miracle, three decades plus of approximate double-digit growth, would have been possible to the same level without the role of the Chinese diaspora, who in many ways provided the financial capital, investment capital, but also had the knowledge uh, and were able to sort of find export markets um, for Chinese produced goods as well. Uh, I, I, it's difficult to say anything, but I agree with you. Uh, it, the Chinese diaspora has been very important. In fact, the Ch Chinese diaspora until very recently has been much more important than Western capital because it was the diaspora from Hong Kong and Taiwan and uh, Singapore and from Malaysia that uh, supplied so much of, uh, of the money and the know-how, so as you say. And this, I think, is also uh, uh, underlines something very interesting about the Chinese. And that is, um, wherever they are and wherever they think, they've got a very, very strong uh, identification with China. You know, that uh, it's a kind of centripetal culture. Okay, well, Martin, thank you very much for that. Let's, let's all give him a round of applause. As I mentioned, Martin's books will be on sale and he'll be signing copies as well. But before we end tonight, can I invite Professor Pip Patterson, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic from the University of Melbourne, to give our vote of thanks to Martin. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to offer special thanks to our keynote speaker this evening, Martin Jakes, and also to our excellent moderator, Oscar Sabatki. It's an honour for the university to host events like this, um, but especially the launch of Martin's updated version of his book. Um, and I'd like to thank also Asia Link and Australia's role in the world for presenting this evening's event. I think it's fair to say that the event has been challenging, thought-provoking, um, confronting even in some ways. Um, and, but, but I think it's, uh, we'll all go away thinking in a new way about the debate on China's rise. And it's an important reminder that in order to grasp the nature of the new global order, we must understand China in its own terms. Last year, the Australian Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, addressed a luncheon hosted by AsiaLink and the Asia Society Australasia Centre on Australia in the Asian Century where she recognised the need to define our new century in entirely new terms, given China's economic transformation, which is transforming the economic and strategic balance of our world. More than ever, our understanding of the new China will influence Australia's position in a, in a changing world. And I really don't need to say that because you've said it so brilliantly. <laughs> Um, tonight's event contributes towards the university's goal to be an engaged institution. We're trying to rise to the challenge. Our engagement agenda has a number of different facets, which include seeking to equip our students with the knowledge and skills, including Chinese language skills, to participate in this major wave of regional development described as the Asian century. Being committed to promoting public debate on the major global issues of our time, tonight is a fine example. Hosting initiatives such as this that seek to build long-lasting networks and encourage cultural understanding between Australia and China, and building a deep engagement with China through our academic offerings and our alumni networks and through outreach bodies including the Confucius Institute, AsiaLink and the Asia Institute. So thank you all for joining us this evening for this stimulating and timely public lecture and thanks once again to Martin and Oscar. Now you've all got a head start on me, um, but if you go up to the foyer, um, you'll be able to purchase a copy of this critically acclaimed book and have it signed by Martin. Um, be quick and good evening. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>